Jackson, who shared his thoughts on what can be learned from what's happening in Asia. Today I'm talking to Walt Patterson, who's an associate fellow at Chatham House and also the author of a book on the power industry called Keeping the Lights On. Walt Patterson, thank you very much for talking to RT. Now, the situation in Japan is bad. We've seen several explosions uh, at Fukushima nuclear power plant. What do you think the chances are that we may see more and this situation carrying on? I'm sure that the people working on the site hope that they've got it under control, but they seem to be releasing an awful lot of hydrogen from at least three reactors and now from a fuel pond as well. And uh, hydrogen's an explosive gas. If it's confined and mixed with air, it, uh, it, produces, it can produce very dramatic explosions as we've seen. So that's clearly a, a, a major concern for them. But I think the explosion problem is almost the least of their problems at the moment because what it has done to the reactors, we don't know. We don't know. It hasn't apparently damaged the containment or the reactor pressure vessels themselves, although I gather there may be a hole in one of the containments in, in, at, uh, at Unit 2. But what bothers me, and I haven't heard any very good confirmation about it, is what it has done to the actual contact between the control room and the reactor itself. Whether the, whether the dials and gauges in the control room are now actually giving reliable information about what's happening inside the reactors, particularly because the sensors for temperature and pressure and water level and so on, in the turbulent conditions that have been happening in those reactors must be, the sensors must themselves now be potentially unreliable, which means that the, the engineers in the control room don't actually know what's going on in the reactors. And what could be going on in those reactors, in your opinion? The problem is that they may have water levels rising and falling. They may have fuel exposed. We know that they have had fuel exposed, which has produced the, the, react the reaction between the, the molten uh, metal cladding and the water that produces the hydrogen. So they've, they've certainly had some fuel damage. They may well have fuel, ceramic fuel pellets that are now also circulating through the core and that will be clogging up channels and generally generally changing the configuration, the geometry in the core. And unless the, react, unless the reactor engineers know what is going on, they're liable to do something wrong. They're liable to do the wrong thing. That's what happened at the accident at Three Mile Island in the United States, that uh, en engineers who thought they were doing the right thing to protect the, protect the core opened valves when they should have closed them and vice versa and wound up exposing the core and causing a major meltdown. You've mentioned that the uranium rods in reactor number two at Fukushima were exposed, and we know that they were exposed certainly for a period of time. How dangerous is that? Well, the, the, the fuel, fuel elements, when they're running in the reactor, with the chain reaction running, the, uh, bu the buildup of radioactive waste in the fuel rods themselves gradually accumulates quite a, a sizable inventory of very hot radioactive waste. And when they, they, they talk about the reactors all shutting down at the time of the earthquake, which means that they shut down the chain reaction, but you cannot shut down the radioactive waste. And anything up to 10% of the heat in the reactor core when it's, when, it's, when it's running comes from the radioactive waste, not from the chain reaction. You can't shut down the heat from the waste. And that heat means that you have to keep taking the heat away or the temperature of the fuel rods goes up very fast. And what has happened in, I think, all three units now is that the fuel has been at least partly exposed such that it then allows its own temperature to go up until the metal tubes melt. And the metal tubes melt and the little fuel pellets, which are just like little sweeties, fall, fall down the uranium, fall, falls down into, into the water. And, of course, the problem that produces is that if enough of them fall together, they can start up a chain reaction again. And despite all this and what you're talking about, this sort of self-perpetuating scenario, the government uh, in Japan keeps saying that the safety levels are fine, there's nothing for people to worry about. Do you think they're telling the whole truth? I'm not sure they know the whole truth. That's part of the problem. I mean, in the circumstance, it would be bad enough if it were normal times, but this is after an earthquake and an enormous tsunami. 
and the communication channels and the normal organization, even of a society as organized as Japan, has taken a terrible hit. So the fact that they're now faced with a problem like the nuclear problem, when they already have more on their hands than anybody could possibly imagine with the, with the earthquake and the aftermath of the tsunami, that uh, it, 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 it's brutally, uh, brutally difficult for the, for the, both for the government and for the people of Japan. In the rest of the world, we always say that Japan has a reputation as one of the world's most technologically advanced countries, and yet they've been struggling to cool these reactors down for days now. What are the factors at play there, do you think? Well, I think one of the factors is that precisely the fact that, the, that, this is a, that nuclear power is a very, very complicated technology, and its track record of actually dealing with some of the implications of the, of the, the inherent, the inherent characteristics of this, re this type of reactor uh, is, is not good. I, I found last night an article that I wrote nearly 40 years ago describing an intense controversy in the United States about the performance precisely of the so-called emergency cooling systems on water-cooled reactors. And the, the performance was criticized by independent experts in the U.S., but the then nuclear establishment, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, waved the concerns aside. And this was at the time when Fukushima 1 was being built. And uh, the, same, the, the same problem is inherent in this kind of reactor. The only kind of reactor that anybody is building now anywhere in the world. These reactors were originally built as power plants for submarines. And the, obviously the, overall, the overriding design criterion is that it has to be compact enough to fit inside the hull of a submarine. That means that it has to produce an enormous amount of heat in a very small volume and the only way that it can do that is with very, very high pressure water, which means in turn that the walls of the reactor, the boiler, the reactor pressure vessel, have to be 20 centimeters thick. And this poses all kinds of safety problems if there is any possibility of the pressure being lost, or even worse, if the pressure vessel itself might happen to be breached. And these are the problems that these engineers are now trying to cope with in, in Japan. Some commentators and experts are saying that this is starting to look a lot like Chernobyl. What do you think about that? I hope that we are still going to be a long way short of a, uh, of a Chernobyl here, particularly for one reason, that even if there were a major release of radioactivity from one or more of the reactors, the, the event at Chernobyl was accompanied by an enormous fire which produced a huge plume of hot air carrying radioactivity right up into the stratosphere. And that radioactivity was then carried all over the planet by stratospheric winds. I think that I, I can't think of a mechanism that would distribute radioactivity on that kind of scale from anything that could possibly happen at Fukushima. But we have heard that they have already had some fires including a fire in a fuel pond when, in which the cooling apparently failed. And any kind, of, any kind of heat source like that will at least produce some kind of updraft to lift some radioactivity of some kind into the, into the upper atmosphere, into the, into, in, into the wind where it can be carried some distance. And obviously there are a lot of factors at play, like whether there's a fire, in which direction the wind's blowing. Absolutely. But w what's, what are the chances that a radioactive cloud could reach Russia from Japan? I think very low. I think very low. Uh, for, for one thing, the prevailing wind is not in that direction. And for another thing, as I say, I, I can't think of a mechanism that would lift a significant amount of radioactivity high enough for it to travel that kind of distance. So. I don't think I don't think there's any any reason for concern you know, on for Russia or for North America for that reason. Japan is very unstable geographically in terms of earthquakes, and yet uh, the Japanese have chosen to build a lot of nuclear power stations, base a lot of their power supply on nuclear energy. Do you think this will change the attitude to nuclear power in Japan? I think it is bound to. Uh, there have been, of course, uh, there's been quite a substantial body of opinion in Japan, including among seismologists, that building nuclear plants anywhere in Japan is not a good idea. My personal feeling is that building nuclear plants anywhere is not a good idea for basically economic reasons. They are very expensive, 
They tend to be unreliable. They are a kind of electricity which is very inflexible and difficult for an electricity system to use because you can lose a thousand megawatts in two minutes. In one way and another, I have never been persuaded that the economic case for nuclear power is especially convincing. And in recent years, of course, that has been the major controversy about nuclear power investment all over the world. Private investors do not want to spend money on nuclear plants for quite understandable reasons. They don't think they get their money back. But now the safety issue has come back again. And that will complicate things even further. And of course, we haven't had a big nuclear accident really since Chernobyl, right? Since 1986. And so that people must have been assuming that nuclear power is becoming safer while we're well, working on it's it. It's partly that, but I think a much more important factor is that until quite recently, nobody has built any nuclear plants, not in the West. There have been no, no nuclear plants ordered in the U.S., for example, since 1978. And, since and every plant ordered since 1974 has been cancelled up until the last couple of years when there has suddenly begun to be an, a great deal of U.S. government taxpayers' money on offer as subsidies for construction of new nuclear plants. And even that is not persuading the companies in the U.S. to build them. So the, the, the reason that people have not been objecting to nuclear power for the past 20 years is that nobody's been building them. So now you're going to get a, a situation which I think may, might turn into a rerun of the kind of controversies of the first generation of nuclear plants in the late 60s and 70s, when the public was deeply unhappy about a lot of these plans. And we may well find that happens again. Walt Patterson, thank you very much.